What's up guys? Today I'm going to be teaching you how to use the Amnesic Incognito Live System or TAILS. This is a Debian based operating system that is meant to be booted off of a USB stick, thus the live system. And this live system is set up to be amnesic, meaning anything that you do inside of Tails OS is gonna be erased whenever you reboot the system. So if an adversary were to steal your laptop or steal the USB stick that you have Tails installed to, they're not gonna be able to get any of your sensitive data off of it, or if they forensically analyze it, they won't be able to trace what you've been doing. And finally, the incognito functionality of Tails is provided by the fact that all of the OS's traffic is routed through the Tor network by default. And every single tail system looks the same to servers out on the internet. So it's very difficult for anyone, even a nation state, to track you when you're using Tails, which is probably why it's the favorite operating system for people that spend a lot of time on the dark web and really just for anyone that needs to have top-notch anonymity. Now, even though Tails sounds like a foolproof anonymity toolkit, there are still ways that you can screw up with installing Tails and using Tails that will completely ruin your OPSEC. So make sure that you do thorough research beyond what's covered in this video. Now, to get started with installing Tails, when you click on this Install Tails uh, tab at the top of their website, you'll be brought to this page that takes you to different instructions depending on what operating system you're using. But really, the only differences between installing Tails on Windows, Mac OS, or Linux are the tools that you're gonna use for writing to your USB stick, writing the Tails image to your USB stick, and the tool that you're gonna to use to verify the image. Now, since this is a guide for the ultra paranoid, obviously I recommend using Linux to download, write, and verify your Tails image because there's a lower chance of any shenanigans taking place since most or all of your software in Linux is gonna be free and open source. Uh, but again, if you want to use Windows or Mac OS, most of this guide is still gonna apply, just different software for writing to USB and verifying the image. Now, most guides um, that tell you how to install Tails and you know even what they have here on their official site will recommend you download Tails from the website directly, from you know download.tails.net directly. Now, there's a couple of reasons why you don't want to do this if you're ultra paranoid. Okay, number one. Um, some of you might have noticed that I'm visiting tails.net in the Tor browser, okay? So if, you, if your adversary is, say, a nation state or it's somebody that is able to get records from your ISP and basically view what type of websites you go to, you probably don't want them to know that you know about Tails because then they might start watching you a little bit closely. You know, you might make your way onto a list. I mean, there's some people out there that think your name will get put on a list just for downloading and using the Tor browser. If that's true, you're definitely on the list if you're using Tails, okay? Your name's gonna be underlined, highlighted, and bumped up probably a couple hundred rows <laughs> if you're using Tails. Um, so if you wanted to download it directly from the website, do it over Tor, but what I really recommend doing is downloading it over BitTorrent, um, you know, with a free and open source BitTorrent client like QBitTorrent, and make sure when you're inside of your torrenting application that you're using a VPN or that you're using public Wi-Fi somewhere to mask your IP. So that way you're able to download the image file without your adversary, if it's a nation state, knowing that you ever went to tails.net. And another benefit to downloading Tails or really any Linux ISO over BitTorrent is the file is being shared in a distributed manner. So it lowers the chances that you're gonna end up downloading a backdoored ISO because in order to do that, through BitTorrent, what a hacker would have to do is first compromise the Tails.net website here, and they would have to host a corrupted magnet link or you know a hacked um, torrent image. And then they would also have to spin up a bunch of machines 
in different countries to seed the ISO. Um, so at the very least, creating a fake BitTorrent download is gonna be more expensive than creating a fake centralized download. And it's much harder to man in the middle than a centralized download. And since advanced Linux users tend to download their ISOs this way, there's probably an increased chance that people are actually verifying these images that are downloaded over BitTorrent or that people are going to notice quicker if something happens, you know, if a hacked uh, image somehow makes it into the BitTorrent download. Now, once your files have downloaded, we need to do a verification on them to make sure that they didn't get corrupted or modified by your adversary in transit. If you downloaded the file with a torrent, then this is actually already done for you in a way with the info hash. But since this guide is for the ultra paranoid, we might as well do some additional verifications with PGP. Now, it is worth mentioning that on the Tails.net site, they have an additional way to verify. I think this is also the way that they recommend it since it's got the big green button um, where you can use JavaScript that's running from this site to check and make sure that you know what you downloaded was legit. But since this is an ultra paranoid guide, using JavaScript is probably not something you're going to want to do. So we're going to use OpenPGP, uh, or I'm actually going to use GNU, or what is it called? GNU Privacy Assistant, I'm pretty sure. GPA, something like that, um, just for purposes of the video. But you could use OpenPGP, and then if you're on Mac OS or Windows, there's some other kind of software you're going to use for verifying PGP signatures. Um, so... What you're going to need is the signing key. So we'll go ahead and download that. And the signature should actually be um, in the torrent if you downloaded it that way, but you're also going to need, yeah, this is the signature right here. So if you just downloaded the file through Tor in your browser or you didn't download it through a torrent, then you're gonna also need to get that uh, signature. Okay, so we're gonna go into GNU Privacy Assistant. Now, if you don't know anything about PGP, I just suggest looking up another guide real quick because um, that's something people get tripped up, tripped up on a bit. But you need to have a key that you've created for yourself already, so I've got that. And um, the next thing we're gonna do is import that key that I downloaded, and let me see, it's gonna be in here, browser, downloads, tail signing key. Okay, so now that key is imported into GNU Privacy Assistant, or you can also do it in OpenPGP. Uh, I'm just using this because it's probably better for a tutorial, probably look better on video. Um, as you can see, the validity and the trust of this key is currently unknown. Now, this is just a key file that we downloaded from this Tails.net website. And if we're ultra paranoid, we're not just going to trust the file downloaded from here because if somebody hacked Tails.net and they gave us a corrupted file or they corrupted the BitTorn or whatever, it's very trivial for them to also put a corrupted signing key that when you run it through verifications, it's going to look legit. So we want to now go to a third party PGP key server that has the Tails developer key on it as well and make sure that the key on this third party server matches the key that we just downloaded from here. Okay, so what we're going to want to do is, and this is um, pgp.mit.edu. It's one of the older or maybe oldest running um, key servers still in existence. And it's a very, very simple one. Um, it doesn't, I'm pretty sure it doesn't even require JavaScript because it's just HTML. So why don't we just go ahead and do that since, you know, we're ultra paranoid. And um, 
Let me see, verify that it's just... Yeah, so it's just loading some HTML. Very basic website. So anyway, what we're gonna want to do now is search for this key, and we should be able to just do Tails Developer for now. Copy that, put that into the search string, and do the search. Oh, we also want to show EGP fingerprints for keys. Now, this is going to return multiple results, uh, but that's fine. I'll show you guys how to deal with that. And it's gonna take a while since we're using Tor, but that's the cost of being ultra paranoid. <laughs> Okay, so like I said, we got multiple results, but the one that we're really looking for here is the offline long-term identity key. And sure enough, if we bring up GNU Privacy Assistant, we'll see same thing here in the username, Tails Developer, offline long-term identity key, and we can copy this fingerprint, which is basically like a summary. Uh, it's a unique sort of signature for this key. And we can see that it matches. So uh, we don't actually have to download and import this, like just checking the fingerprint should be good enough. And so we can now be fairly certain that this key here is good because it's very unlikely that our adversary would be able to compromise both tails.net and pgp.mit.edu. And you can also check this against additional key servers as well. Generally, people who develop software that's really popular will upload their keys to multiple key servers so that you can triple, quadruple, quintuple check however much you want to do to make yourself uh, feel comfortable that what you've got is legit. Okay, so now, since we believe that this key is good. We're gonna go ahead and sign it with our key. We'll hit yes, and then we're gonna to have to put in the password for your private key. All right, for some reason, the video file got corrupted at this point, but whatever, I'll just record it again. So after you've signed the Tails developer's key, the validity should say fully valid. And now we can use this validated key to verify the signature of the image file. So to do that, click on open the file manager and click the file folder icon to select a file. And you're gonna want the img.sig file from the torrent, or if you downloaded it directly from the browser, you can grab that file uh, from the same area where you got the signature file, or where you got the signing key rather. So import that. And we want to select check signatures of selected file. All right, and it's gonna say valid as long as everything's good. So now you can be certain that that Tails OS image file that you're going to write to your um, USB is valid. It hasn't been modified at all down to the byte level. So for writing to your USB, if you're on Linux, I recommend using DD because it's already going to be installed on your system, uh, but you could use GNOME Disk, or of course, if you're on Mac OS or Windows, then you're going to end up using uh, something else entirely different. But anyway, the command for Linux is dd if equals, uh, and this is going to be the name of the file that's in that you downloaded the image file, and you also need to know the device name for your USB stick. So we'll run LSBLK to get that real quick. And looks like SDE is the name for my flash drive now. So 
You want to make sure you get the right one there so you don't accidentally delete any data. And command is going to be dd. I'll just clear my screen real quick. dd if equals tails image file of equals dev sde. Pretty sure that's what it said, right? Yep, sde. And we'll put bs equals 16m o flag equals direct status equals progress. And of course, we have to do this as root. And this should only take a few seconds to copy the data over. Boom, and now our Tails USB is written. And if you wanted to boot into Tails on the same computer, you can just reboot and then uh, select it from the boot menu, or you can remove the USB stick and then put it in a different laptop to boot from Tails like I'm about to do. So let's go do that. All right, hopefully there's enough lighting for this to look good. So as you can see, I've got an old ThinkPad here, a X301, look at that Windows Vista sticker. My, my, this is an old laptop, but perfect candidate for running Tails OS. So I've got my Tails OS flash drive here, which is actually kind of cool. It's got both USB and USB-C, but we're gonna be using USB because this old girl, she don't know nothing about that USB-C. So we're gonna go ahead and put our USB drive in and power her on. I've just done some basic cleaning to this uh, laptop, but I haven't really done much testing to it other than that. All right, so it looks like we were set to boot from USB by default, so we'll just go ahead and go right into Tails. Um, if it doesn't do that, you know, if it if you've got a laptop with another OS already on it, you have to just go into your BIO settings and change that. Um, but yeah, I'm not even gonna bother showing that because it's different depending on your uh, manufacturer. And uh, while this is booting up, I might as well mention um, I'm installing this off of a flash drive but it is possible to use different kinds of removable media like say if you wanted tails to run a little bit faster you could install it to an external SSD um, like you know one that you plug in via USB or actually I have one sitting around here somewhere um, like this All right so you could probably run tails off of this Samsung USB and get a slightly better I.O. Um, you could also run it off of things like a CD, because um, this does have a CD drive. Or you could also run it off of an SD card. That might be handy if, of course, you've got a laptop that can take SD cards. I don't think this one can. But if your laptop can accept, especially a micro SD card, uh, if it can boot from micro SD, that's really small, really easy to conceal, and might be handy for uh, people that are using Tails. Well, that's not a good sound. <laughs> Although, if that's the hard drive failing, it really doesn't matter for this uh, Tails OS video. It's just going to be a little bit noisy but everything's running off the USB, so no problems there. It almost sounds like there might be a CD in there. The tray's not opening, so that might be something to look into later, but anyway. We're on our Tails welcome screen. So there's this additional settings. Might as well just show you guys this. 
where you can set an administrator password. Um, that's probably one of the only things that you would need to change in here. Everything else is already pretty much set for um, optimal anonymity. And you can change your keyboard here and your layouts too if you need to, your languages. But anyway, we'll go ahead and start Tails. And this might take a couple of minutes on your computer, definitely a couple of minutes on this computer here. All right, so now we've got our desktop loaded. I believe this is GNOME. Um, let's see. Yeah, so it's using GNOME and it's using Wayland. Okay, interesting. I did not know that Tails had switched to Wayland. Um, so you can also see here in my system overview that this is just a Core 2 Duo uh, 1.4 gigahertz and it's only got four gigs of RAM. So this is obviously a very low spec system, but it is able to run Tails and honestly, as far as um, very private, secure, and anonymous systems go, Tails is probably the only one you can really run on a computer like this. Um, I don't think you would have a good time running uh, Hunix KVM, since that's going to require you to run a host OS, and then also Hunix Workstation and the Hunix Gateway. If you're running Cubes OS on this, then you'd be running... Um, Dom Zero, Hunix Workstation, Hunix Gateway, Network VM, and a Firewall VM. So, yeah, you'd you'd have um, a pretty bad time. You know, this is not going to be able to run multiple virtual machines at once. But again, it can run Tails just fine. So that's kind of one benefit of uh, Tails over everybody else. Um, so let me go ahead and connect this to Wi-Fi real quick. And show you guys a couple other things. Okay, let's see. Here's Wi-Fi. Okay, so now I'm connected to Wi-Fi and this Tor connection comes up. So um, this is another thing that you might diverge from depending on your um, your requirements. You know, if you're, like it tells you right here, if you're in a country um, where a lot of people use Tor to circumvent censorship and it's not really going to make you stick out, then you can just connect to Tor automatically. Um, and then you also have the option to configure a bridge here if you want, or you can just hide to your network that you're connecting to Tor and it's gonna try to obfuscate 
the fact that you're even using Tor at all. So, you know, this might be what you'd want to use if you're ultra paranoid, but I'm just going to use this for now. And um, there's only a couple other things I'm going to show you within the OS because uh, obviously depending on what you're doing there's going to be a lot more research that you're going to need to do outside of this video for how to remain anonymous online. Uh, some things that I recommend of course this is going to have you using the Tor browser and we're going to see if it already has a very secure connection. It might just take a little while for <laughs> this old girl to start up a browser. I think I should definitely give her some more RAM because, uh, let's see. System monitor. Yeah, some of those or some of those, one of those CPU cores getting hit kind of hard. Um, okay, so, like this is an example here of um, some things that you'd want to change. So, uh, you would, of course, have to change this each time you start Tails because that's how the OS is. It's amnesic, although there are some there is a way to create persistent storage on your Tails USB stick, uh, but I'm not going to do that for now. Um, okay, so for Onion services, we want to always use an Onion site if we've got it available. And we want to have the safest setting. So that's going to get you pretty good... Um, pretty good privacy, like just browsing the web from here on. Um, now another thing you may or may not want to change, I mean there's probably some debate on this, whether or not you should leave uBlock Origin enabled, because on regular Tor browsers, which that's what the majority of people out there are going to be using, you know, people using Tor are just going to use the Tor browser in probably Windows. <laughs> but if um, you have uBlock Origin enabled, it's going to make your browser fingerprint look a little bit different. So that might be a way that an adversary could tell that you're using Tors or, or using, ah, not Tors, Tails, or I can't remember whether Tor in the Hunix workstation has uBlock Origin or not. If it doesn't, then that really is going to make you stick out a little bit. So that's kind of the case for disabling it and the case for leaving it on is um, it's going to block ads. Although if you're using the safest setting in, um, in Tor and if you're mainly browsing to dark websites and stuff like that, then I don't think it'll really make too much of a difference blocking ads with uBlock Origin. Um, that might actually be an interesting thing to test, whether all those weird, like, uh, I guess CSS or like those weird GIFs and stuff that pop up on some of the Tor search engines, if those can be blocked with uBlock Origin. Um, so yeah, this is your browser. And there's a couple other really good utilities installed on Tails by default. So this is where you would set up your persistent storage. Um, if I was going to do that, and it basically creates a, I'm pretty sure it's a Lux encrypted um, persistent storage. So it is encrypted. Like if somebody stole your Tails USB, it's not like if you have persistent storage, they're going to automatically be able to get that stuff. They're just going to see an encrypted container on there, and then they have to try to decrypt it. And as long as you have a good password, then uh, they're not going to be able to get into it. We've got Thunderbird, so this is a pretty good email client to use, and you can also configure PGP keys with that too, now that you have a PGP key. Um, Keypass XC, this is of course the my recommended offline password manager, and most other people recommend it as well. That's why it's included with Tails. 
and we can start going through some of these other um, so this is a way to back up your uh, persistent storage because since it's encrypted you could back this up into well you still might want to avoid Google Drive and Dropbox depending on your um, security plan but because it's encrypted it, it doesn't even necessarily matter too much what cloud storage you put it in as long as people don't have the keys and then this way uh, when you're using different tail systems you can kind of recover all of your documents or whatever you were using uh, download it over Tor down onto this system and then continue working if say uh, you have to pull a Mr. Robot and you feel like you've got to destroy your laptop and microwave your USB and stuff like that. I mean, hey, this is a guide for the ultra paranoid. So wouldn't be surprised if some people out there want to do that stuff. Um, Electrum, Bitcoin wallet. So that's going to give you probably some of the best privacy you can have with Bitcoin, although having privacy and anonymity with Bitcoin would really warrant a video in and of itself. So this uh, onion circuits should just show, yeah, onion circuits um, built for various connections. So different ones are gonna be built through, um, I believe different sites in Tor and like definitely if you're like curling because anything you do over uh, tails. I mean, I know I've said that already, but everything is over Tor. So if I I do this to try to get my IP address, it gives me a random one and uh Let's see. Yeah, so you see, it builds different circuits for like different curl commands or different uh, connections to various things out there on the internet. And let's see. Um, so you've got image viewer. I, I also believe there's a thing on here to remove um, metadata. Yeah, here we go, a metadata cleaner. So this is an important thing to use if you're gonna be sending files or especially videos or images to people because if you just take a picture with your cell phone, there's gonna be metadata associated with that, possibly even your geolocation. And if you send that, it doesn't matter if you're using Tails. If your adversary intercepts that, they're gonna have your real location. So this is definitely a program that you might end up using depending on what you're doing within Tails. Um, LibreOffice, so that's a good free and open source office suite. Um, there's a tool for unlocking Veracrypt containers. And, oh, Onion Share. So I've, did a whole video about this. This is a, I believe it's a bundled, um, yeah, chat room, or well, you can share files, receive files, publish a website, and I believe there's a chat room functionality too. Maybe they don't have that anymore. Um, so yeah, this this can let you, I mean, this can literally let you set up your own hidden service, like your own tour site and host it from this laptop or from whatever you want to run tails off of. I mean, if you were going to be hosting a real serious hidden service, you probably would want it on a server instead of a laptop, but hey, it's possible to do this. And let's see, let's maybe talk about one more application. Um, I don't think I saw a, a Monero wallet yet. Um, hmm. Huh, seems like there isn't a Monero wallet that comes with uh, Tails. Well, that's something that you might want to install. So maybe we'll save that for another video. Additional software 
to install after you've installed Tails, but you pretty much get the basics here. I mean, now you, you see how to browse the web, you see how you can sh send and receive files and how to remove metadata from those files. So that should have you covered for most applications within Tails. And like I said, I'll just make more videos about Tails if you guys are interested. But for now, be sure to like and comment to hack the algorithm. Follow me on Odyssey. Have a great rest of your day.